just yeah okay i just remembered that we need to record this um it's recording now um yeah so today is the second probabilistic programming session um so we have been uh, so i made a couple of video lectures on uh, on this particular notebook they were all available on um on YouTube via the, the link on uh, bmlip.nl. Um, yeah. Um, let me just zoom in. So uh, please, if you have any questions on uh, this particular session or on this notebook or on uh, everything we do in uh, here, so, so everything with Formulab on generating messages and and looking at these computations that produce marginal distributions. Um, now is the time to ask. Please, please let me know. I can imagine that if um, if you're behind, that you haven't had the time to look at these lectures uh, yet. Um, and um, uh, I, I suspect that's the case because I haven't gotten any uh, questions on Piazza and this particular probabilistic programming session is a lot harder than uh, the, the last one. Ah, so we got a question. Um, hi, why is message one beta 3,2? Is it not beta 1,1? Um, wh which message do you mean exactly? So uh, this message here. So in the beta Benui section, message one. Uh, Tahan, could you? I, I can't see your first name actually in, in Teams, but could you explain to me exactly which message you mean? So in the first uh, section of, so the, the part on beta Benui, uh, we start with a prior uh, of 1,1, 1, 1, and then when we move to this second part of that, where we have multiple questions, I actually changed the prior to, uh, let's see. Um, we're also going to change the prior. The company now assumes that you must have some skill if you apply for the position. This is reflected in prior beta distribution with AS3 and BS2. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so the, the very first part is, <laughs> yeah, so the first part is just to show what an uninformative prior is, namely a flat line. All uh, values for theta are equally probable. Uh, but that is somewhat uninteresting because that means that your margin will always be um, based on the likelihood. Uh, so that's why I change it in the example here. So as soon as I made that point, we're gonna move into a slightly more interesting prior. Uh, let's see, yeah, yeah, this this red line. All right, second question. Uh, can you say again about the clamps? Yes. Um, so uh, when we create factor graphs, when we write factor graphs uh, by hand, um, we do these. We do this with respect to variables that are unknown. So in this case, that's just x1, x2, and theta. But uh, in order to be able to uh, do computations on this graph, um, you need additional uh, variables. So here, f of a is the prior. The prior is a beta prior, but a beta prior has two parameters, namely a and b, or alpha and beta. Um, so because they are fixed, they do not appear in this uh, manually constructed factor graph. Um, so or at least we ignore them, we leave them out. Um, but that's not how Formulab works. In with Formulab, you define a node of a fixed structure. Let me see, let me just go. Oh yeah. So you define a beta distribution node, and a beta distribution node has, per definition, an outcome variable which you can name to be whatever you want. But it also has two parameters, a and b. Uh, now to indicate that these two parameters are not unknown variables, but that we have clamped them. To, we have set them to certain values. We introduce this clamp uh, operation. So th this clamp just means that 
this A variable in the beta node has been clamped or has been fixed or has been set to a particular value. Same is true for this B parameter. Um, so it resembles this um, dark uh, black box here, but there's a conceptual difference in that X1 is observed. So we've, we've done an experiment and we've observed data for X1, whereas alpha and beta or A and B are not observed, but they are set by us. They're, we fixed these parameters to certain values. So you could fix them or you could set them to other values and that constitutes your how you yeah that constitutes your prior so you set them to uh, 1 comma 1 and someone else sets them to 2 comma 1 and someone else sets them to 3 comma 2 um, so that's conceptually a different thing than than uh, observing in practice um, in formula we clamp parameters um, that we yeah we we fix ourselves and we use placeholders to indicate that we're going to observe data for uh, certain variables. Um, yeah, okay, the third question is also what is meant by clamp parameters? Uh, and then, yeah, that's why with the normal distribution, the axis also have clamps. Yes, exactly. So, um, yes, exactly. So the, the axis also have clamps here. Um, <clears throat> those are the variances that we set here. So that's uh, for this first likelihood of X1 given theta, that's normal, but then we have fixed that variance parameter 10. And for the other one, we've uh, fixed it to 15. Uh, so that's something that we again designed. Uh, we, we, we didn't observe this, we designed this. So they are also clamped. Um, and you could, you could treat that as an unknown variable. So you could put a prior on that and then try to do inference for that variance parameter. But we'll go into that and a bit later, uh, not in this session. Are there any more questions? If you uh, if you had the time, if you managed to um, go through the lectures and the and that well, watch the videos and and went through the lecture notes, could you please type yes in the chat so then I'll, I'll I get some I get an idea of how many people managed to. Uh, uh, oh, right, okay, that's that's a that's quite a few people. Okay. So you have 30 people in chat and two, four, six, eight, nine people have mentioned uh, that they got around to this. That's not bad. Um, but it also means that uh, a number of people didn't get around to this. Um, Yeah, so the probability programming sessions don't introduce new material. So um, it's you could see this also as a catch-up moment because you spend a bit more time with the material that Bert already introduced. Um, and it's something that, uh, yeah, if you don't get around to probability programming two right now, then I suggest you finish uh, Bert's lectures and prepare for Bert, uh, the, the next lecture that Bert is going to give. And then at the end of the course, when um, when you're reviewing all of the course material, then you might have a, another look at the privacy programming sessions. It's just a, a way to get your hands dirty with all the material that's been given so far. Um, all right, um, I don't see any new questions appearing, so um, what I'm going to do now is um, <coughs> um, I'm going to tell you about the probabilistic programming two assignment, and we're going to walk through probabilistic programming one. And um, if any other, yeah, feel free to ask questions on 
privacy program too in the meantime. I'll just go back and then I'll answer them. Right, so this morning I uh, made the Privacy Programming 2 assignment available for everyone. It's exactly the same setup as before. You download the assignments in a zip file. Uh, note that um, uh, hold on. So note that when you unpack um, PP assignment two or PP two assignment, uh, this time you're going to get an IPython notebook and a workspace directory and a PNG file. Uh, so keep all of those files in the same directory because the PP two assignment notebook checks for, it visualizes this factor graph in the same directory is that you're currently in. So unpack that zip and you move this notebook somewhere where uh, the PNG file is not in the same directory, then it will not be able to find this link and you will not see this factor graph. And the factor graph is actually quite important or useful uh, to understand the assignment. So, so keep that in mind. That was not the case in the first uh, processing program assignment. That is the case in this assignment. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll quickly walk through this assignment and um, if you have any questions that you spot already, just let me know. Um, right, so we have a um, factor graph here. It resembles uh, one of the factor graphs on the exercises. Uh, it's not the same, but it, it does focus on the same type of elementary operations, namely um, uh, matrix multiplication, factor addition and subtraction under Gaussians. So we have a graph. Uh, on the left side, there is two variables, X and Y. Um, there's, a, there's a plus node here. So chi1, that's the addition of the factor Gaussian X and the factor Gaussian Y. Then there's a multiplication node where we multiply chi1 with uh, a fixed transition matrix A, which is shown here. Uh, which produces the uh, variable chi2. Chi1 and chi2 are intermediate variables. And then we have a fixed vector b, which is introduced here, and uh, we do a vector subtraction operation, which produces the random variable z. Um, so your, um, in this assignment, you will actually sp specify a model in Fornilab and compute these messages. Um, so in this first assignment, I'll give you some hints and some tips on how to specify a model in Fornilab. Note that um, in this Provisic Programming session, there are quite a few model descriptions and they all follow the same syntax, the same, uh, same structure. You start by defining a factor graph and then you use this at RV macro, so uh, a random variable. Um, you add a variable which is distributed. If it's stochastic, it's distributed in some way. And if it's a use an equals operator. And so in the assignment, I've given you some clues on which distributions you can uh, call. So Gaussian mean variance, precision, gamma, Michel, Betty, Bernoulli, Categorical, and Um So so I haven't told you exactly what parameters you have to enter for these, but this will be a good test on whether you've understood, whether you've memorized some of these uh, uh, distributions. So a Gaussian mean variance has a mean and a variance, which is uh, quite self-descriptive. But for instance, a Bernoulli has a random variable and then a rate parameter, a single rate parameter. A beta has an alpha and beta. Um, right, so in this, very first part, you will have to compute the message towards the variable chi1. Um, so a few things are already given to you, and then you have to complete the model description. And then uh, there's a there's some syntax here to compile the algorithm and actually execute the message passage. So you don't have to do that. You just have to uh, define the model, specify the model. Uh, so this uh, generates a message, or at least populates this message uh, data structure. And, um, 
there are two cells here that check the format of your uh, message array. Uh, and then hidden, there's also a uh, test on to see whether uh, the messages have the, the right parameters. In this second uh, question, you will uh, compute a message towards the uh, second temporary variable, chi2. So that's the message going out of the middle square node. That's the multiplication with the uh, with the matrix. So the matrix is given, and you just have to complete the model specification for uh, uh, for matrix multiplication. Again, there are two tests. And the the third part is uh, compute the message towards the random variable z. Uh, so b is given plus uh, a set of parameters for uh, chi two. So complete the model description. Uh, compute the messages and then it checks for the message again. Uh, yeah, so basically Probability Programming 2 is just about completing the model specification for this graph and we've cut this up in three parts. And uh, I've, the way I've cut it up means that if you get the first question wrong, so if you don't, if your message computation is incorrect, that doesn't matter, that doesn't have any influence on the second message computation. I basically just restart each question with a different set of parameters for uh, guy one and guy two. Um, right, so um, have a look, try this out, and if everything runs well, then uh, you can submit it as before. I've um, so this morning I've downloaded all the submissions for for the Privacy Program One assignment. The assignment will remain available. Oh. Uh, do we have to draw the graphs as well? No, you don't have to. Um, I can't check whether you've you've generated the right graph visually. Uh, so this is all auto graded. So I have to write auto graded uh, unit tests. I can't test the graph. So I I can just test the parameters of the messages. Uh, so you don't have to compute the uh, you don't have to visualize the graphs. Um, so I'll keep the privacy programming one. Uh, yeah. Uh, session um, open so people can still have a look and download the assignment and everything. Um, I've downloaded the submissions. I'll put them in the author grader later this afternoon. I might have them done by the end of the day. Um, otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, give you feedback uh, uh, at the start of next week. Um, we can Uh, if you want, I can quickly walk through the solutions to the first probabilistic program assignment. If you haven't gone around to that yet and you want to try this for yourself, then you know, spoiler alerts, you can, I can also stop with this and I can, uh, at the final probabilistic program session, I can walk through all of the assignments um, if that's what you want. So uh, let me know in chat whether you want me to go through the solutions to the first public programming assignment or whether you haven't gotten around to it yet and um, uh, would still like to make a submission. All right. So far, it's been unanimous. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, Um, yes, so you'll get a look under the hood of how these notebooks are made. So in Provisic Programming 1, in, at least in the assignment, uh, it's all about likelihood functions. And we're just going to specify a likelihood function and we're going to compute some properties of that function. Um, so this is the function. We have three data points, 0, 0, 1. Uh, we have a range of parameters from theta uh, from 0 to 1. We've taken a yeah, so the range covers 100 points. Uh, I've written out the likelihood function um, for a Bernoulli likelihood uh, explicitly here. <coughs> and if you plot that, it has a, uh, uh, a rather nice curve. So the first question, what is the likelihood of theta is 0 0.5? So this is a function you add in this data set and then you add in theta for, uh, the, yeah, for any value on this range. So the first answer is just like you had a D, uh, is, and then you enter 0 0.5. Uh, so 
the Bruyne. I, I also can't see your f first name in, in uh, Teams. It's You said it's you tonight. I uh, said the deadline for the Proxy Programming One session is the start of the next session. So at 10.45 was the deadline. But if you want, you can still, submission is still open. Um, uh, or maybe not actually. Otherwise, uh, look away now. Mute your, uh, mute your, uh, mute this session, and then uh, send me the notebook on uh, Piazza, which you can do privately to an instructor, I think. Then I'll add it to the submissions, and oh uh, yeah, I'll give you some feedback later on. Um, so the, yeah, so the first answer is just like your D, and then you enter 0 0.5, and that gives you a likelihood of uh, 0 0.125. Uh, so you're just evaluating the likelihood function at a particular point. The second uh, question was, add the following data, 0, 1, 1, to your set and recompute the likelihood of theta is 0 0.5. So, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll, okay, so I'll re-download the submissions after uh, we're done with this, uh, um, with this session, with this MS Teams session. Uh, so if you add this data to your data set, so um, we have 0, 0, 1, that's what we already have, and then we add 0, 1, 1 to that data set, and then we recompute the likelihood of theta as 0 0.5. So D is still your data set, you just enter that here, that's now different, uh, and you want to still know the likelihood of theta 0 0.5, so just evaluate this function and it gives you a different value, a lower value. Um, so the likelihood seems to have gone down. Let's plot the likelihood function again for the larger data set. So here you can see the larger data set and uh, and, and we're plotting it here. I've, I've done this part specifically because if you get stuck on, I don't know how to add this data set, then basically the answer is here. Uh, so this first session is very, um, it's supposed to help you get used to this idea of, uh, of completing assignments in Jupyter and using Julia. Um, so conceptually and theoretically, it's not very challenging, and I've given away a couple of things. Um, but if you did find this session challenging, uh, let me know. Then uh, I, I could use all the feedback uh, you have on, on these notebooks. Uh, Hilda, you raised your hand. Hi, it's Hannah, but that's okay. Hannah, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. The, um, uh, does it matter if the... Um, Right now, as I structured my the, the code in in this assignment, uh, you have basically have to run it from uh, top to bottom because I was lazy and just put a D instead of uh, to add. So I just put it like wait, D and then I just put it like this instead of. Uh, actually putting the entire thing again because I'm lazy. Oh, um, uh, well, that's a good question, actually. Uh, you, you get the right answer, but um, if, because I'm reusing D every time you basically use the last variable you generated. Yeah. So if you would independently run the, uh, uh, run the cell, so if you, uh, I think at the bottom you add again, then yeah, uh, yeah. at some point you would get the wrong answer. No, uh, this is fine. Uh, so the most important thing is that when you when you look at this likelihood function, it, it performs this sum over D. And we saw that in the probabilistic programming session itself, that, that if you take a product over N independent Bernoulli distributions, then because there's an exponentiation, you can take the sum in the exponent. So, so that's that's what encoded here. It's just the sum over d in the exponent, or the sum over one minus d in the exponent. So, as long as this sum works, uh, you're good to go. And okay. yeah, I just checked. So, I mean, there's still the option that it creates uh, a list of lists, like Python, where yeah, you would have zero zero one, and then you would have a list of zero one one. In that case, the sum would fail, but that doesn't. That's not the case here. No, I, I checked that it worked, like that it would uh, uh, generate the right array, but I was just wondering with the auto grader if it matters. <laughs> yeah, the auto grader just checks 
uh, for your answer. So you can you can see the hidden test here actually. Mm. So there's an answer, and then I uh, I take this answer added here and I check for uh, within some epsilon distance of that answer. And you don't see this hidden test in the student release version. Okay, great. Uh, so the same is true for probability programming two assignment. We have certain parameters, mean variances, which have values if you've computed them correctly, and I test the um, I test the submitted values uh, within epsilon. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Oh, we have another question. I was wondering if everyone else's notebook also runs for like 30 seconds before outputting anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a wonderful thing about Julia. Uh, it's blazingly fast. Its motto is uh, uh, runs like C, walks like Python, or walks like Python, runs like C. Um, it is actually blazingly fast, but there's one notorious thing that everyone keeps bumping into, which um, can be a bit frustrating, namely that uh, when you start a notebook or when you start a kernel and you uh, start inputting, you start using packages, it takes some time before all of the code in this uh, package becomes available. So before it's all been pre-compiled into your current uh, session. Uh, some packages are fine. Uh, plots is not fine. Plots is a huge package, especially if you're, if you're pulling in Matplotlib, the uh, Python's um, plotting library. So whenever you do using plots, it takes a while, and then whenever you actually plot that function, um, yeah, it takes it takes quite a few seconds before you see anything at all. This is the major thing, and there's even sort of a, an internal joke within much of the Julia development community that um, time to plot is the real uh, the real kicker. So because the first time you run something, you'll see the time to plot will add 30 seconds or sometimes even a minute to your um, execution time. And then you run the second time and the time to plot is taken out and then everything is a lot faster. Um, I actually this morning uh, answered a um, thing on Piazza with a description of what pre-compilation is. Uh, so that contains a bit more information on uh, why it takes such a long time for uh, for Julia to uh, plot uh, functions? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If if you Google Julia time to plot, that uh, that gives you a lot of uh, interesting discussions. Um, yeah, and and also whenever you Google anything with Julia, be careful that you're not running into Julia Roberts. That's maybe specify Julia programming language. Um, Right, so we have, yeah, we have a larger data set. This plots the likelihood function. You can see why uh, we say that the likelihood is a function on a conditional distribution because it doesn't integrate to one. It, it doesn't scale properly. Um, so you can see this thing uh, just so the scale of the y-axis is actually lower than before. Oh no, that's yeah, okay, that's not the case. Hmm. Uh, I think later on scale decreases. Anyway, the scale is, um, it doesn't integrate to one and the scale can change as the size of the data set grows. Um, ah, right, yeah. Uh, Um, so yeah, so the scaling is something that uh, you should have noticed. Um, and then, yeah, so that's more or less the point that reinforces, or it reinforces this point that a likelihood function is not a conditional distribution. Um, so we see here that, so because we added more ones than, than zero, so before only a, a third of the outcomes uh, was a one, and now with these two additional ones, we actually get a 50-50 ratio of outcomes of one and outcomes of zero. So that means that the, uh, yeah, we have to wait until it replots. But before the likelihood had a, uh, its bump was below 0 0.5, and then we see that it's actually shifted more towards, yeah. So this thing, its maximum, its mode. Um, so most of the mass is below 0 0.5, and the mode is just just below 0 0.5. And then here, it it um, it travels more towards the middle. You can see that it's quite symmetrical for this uh, 
this equal, yeah, this data set of equal proportions of zeros and ones. Uh, and so the tricky thing is that now if you add only ones, um, this is going to favor the distribution towards um, It's going to favor the distribution towards uh, a higher value of theta, so towards what is it, 0 0.7 this time around. Um, so that's what you should have noticed here. So that so that its mode is shifting about. You can see that this time the scale is drastically reduced. Um, so as I said, scale can shrink as a function of the number of uh, observations you make. Um, so the bump we started with a bump on the left. And we added once until we had a 50-50 ratio. Then the bump was in the middle. And then we added once, and we added four once, which completely tips the balance towards um, a positive uh, rate parameter theta. So now the bump is uh, quite, quite sharply, quite definitely uh, uh, above 0 0.5. And so your answer here is that uh, the likelihood of theta 0 0.8 is largest, even though uh, the likelihood of 0 0.8 is uh, lower than the likelihood of uh, 0 0.5 in the previous question. Um, yeah, so that's actually it for all of the assignments in Promising Programming 1, uh, for all the questions in the first Promising Programming assignment. Um, I didn't see any more questions on Promising Programming 2 or on the PP2 assignment. So, uh, and I've taken you through the First assignment. I've shown you. The, yeah, I've shown you the second assignment. Um, I think that's it. Actually, uh, if anyone has any questions, let me know. And otherwise, um, we're moving on to uh, Bird's lecture again on Wednesday. Uh, I'm having issue with an error in the PP2 assignment. So, what is your error? Oh, maybe you can just post this to Piazza. Then, uh, um, if if the assignment doesn't run. Uh, on your machine, I might do another update and then I'll I'll make make an announcement in Piazza that the assignment has been updated. Um, yeah. All right. If there aren't any more questions, then um, I think we'll wrap up this session. Um, yeah. So please submit the notebooks on Canvas. So. Oh. Yeah, so this is Canvas uh, for me. So I go to assignments and I can download. Oh, yeah. So I go Pro C Programming One. Uh, there's a button here, download submissions. That's where I'll download your submission and then I'll, I'll auto grade it. Uh, the deadline says 23 Yeah, okay. So I'll download them again um, tomorrow morning. Um, I'll make sure that the deadline for Pro C Programming Two is. Um, uh, it that it uh, stops uh, before the uh, next session, so that the de the time of the deadline is 10:45. Uh, could you maybe show the last exercise once more? Do you mean the last exercise in Promising Programming Two or in Promising Programming One? PP One. Uh, so you mean this one, which is bigger now, the likelihood of theta 0 0.5 or theta 0 0.8? So the thing is before, yeah, okay. So before we had a data set of 0, 0, 001, 0, 1, 1. So we have three ones and three zeros. And if you plot the likelihood, you see that it's quite symmetrical around this 0 0.5 um, function. So it's, it's, its mode, its maximum point li lies in the middle here, uh, which makes sense because of an equal amount of ones and zeros. Um, if you now add four ones, that tips the balance in the favor of the ones. We now have much more ones than we have zeros. You can see that the Likert function, its shape uh, moves towards um, higher values of theta. You can see that most of the probability, uh, well not, but most of the area of this function uh, lies uh, to the right of theta, so 0 0.5. And so, uh, if you were to compare the likelihood of theta 0 0.8 and theta 0 0.5, you can see that the likelihood of uh, theta 0 0.8 is larger. And that's in the end what we do with likelihood functions. We 
they're based on the data. They're not conditional distributions. Uh, we compare different values of theta uh, for which best fits the data, which best explains the data. So whereas before theta 0 0.5 roughly best explains the data, and now uh, because we added these ones, theta uh, it's not the, the theta 0 0.8 somewhere, so it's not the maximum but it does have a higher likelihood than theta 0 0.5. So overall, the, the point of this first assignment was that um, the mode of the likelihood can shift around and you can see that, uh, or that makes sense if you look at the data. Does that explain um, the last exercise? Yeah, okay. Uh, so now we're so another question in PP2, the simplex distribution can also be made with normal distributions, each entry representing probabilities of 0, 0,1, 0,2 points. Um, I don't know if this is true because I have not tried this. Um, I personally feel that the one-hot encoding is uh, more intuitive. And... Um, The Dirichlet, so you mean the, the simplex distribution, you mean the Dirichlet? Can also be made with normal distributions. Yeah, so the point of a, um, the point of a um, Dirichlet distribution is that it outputs proportions. So it needs to, um, so you can look at the indices of zero, one or two, but it, the, the number that it points out needs to be a factor that sums to one. And only if that's true, does it act as a conjugate prior to the categorical distribution, because the categorical has a parameter, which is a factor of probabilities, of proportions, of, of a, a factor of numbers that sum to one. So I think that if you do this with a normal distribution, where you output zero, one, or two, then you don't get this property. And then, um, then, you, then you don't have a prior that's conjugate to the categorical distribution. Um, I hear someone. Yeah. Anyone else still have a question? Okay. Um, yes. So then, um, uh, yes, I'm going to wrap up this session. Um, we'll see you all uh, next week. Uh, best of luck to anyone who's still uh, behind. Um, yeah, and if there's anything with the um, PP2 assignment, let me know in the Piazza and I'll, I'll probably make an update um, if, if that's necessary. Um, yeah, all right. Enjoy your weekends, everyone, and um, see you uh, next week.